Hey guys, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today's episode is with Hillary Bush of Pollen. Pollen is a professional community for consultants, advisors, fractional business owners, and people with side hustles. We talk a lot about the future of work and how it's changing, her thoughts on dilution, how to get to a no faster, and tips to reduce fundraising friction. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, be sure to check out foundersuite.com if you're a startup or fundingstack.com if you are a VC or advisor to get an awesome collection of tools for fundraising. It includes a massive investor database, a CRM to manage your raise, a virtual data room to run due diligence, plus pitch deck hosting, investor updates, and much more. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them and hit that subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Thank you. Now sit back and enjoy this chat with Hillary. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Hillary Bush of Pollen coming to us from Southern California. How's your day going? It's going really well. Thanks for having me. Glad you could be here. What is Pollen? So Pollen is a professional membership for independent consultants. Uh, we work with people who are really good at what they do and have made you know the big decision to make a bet on themselves and go independent. And the reality is when you do that, you're starting a business. And that process can be really challenging, lonely, confusing. And so you join Pollen, you get instant access to a ton of expert programming, sprints, workshops, all around the business side of building your independent business. You get access to proprietary data, assets, templates, and then you also get access to a community of peers who are really in the trenches alongside you. People at the same phase as you, maybe a little bit further ahead, and our experts and residents who are, you know, experts at what they do and sending the ladder back down. So think of us as your entrepreneurial ecosystem for independence. Okay. What types of independence are we talking about here? Or is it anything? These are folks who primarily come from tech and startups across kind of the core business functions. So think product, marketing, operations, design, the special sauce this creates is that you can actually build your own modular teams from the community within Pollen, and you can barter and exchange skills. So a designer uh, gives direction to a marketer, and a marketer gives direction to a designer. That stuff happens all the time. And it's something that's really different from other kind of professional networks out there, which are just for you know specific verticals. Interesting. So I'm a... Well, actually, I'll just use myself as an example, because before starting Founder Suite, I was yeah. a fractional CFO, fundraising consultant, kind of had that. And I don't think anything existed like this. I mean, there there was Young Entrepreneurs Organization and a few other little groups like that that were kind of, but nothing yeah. for consultants. Yeah. So I guess this is. Yeah. You might be familiar with like, yeah, YPO, Young Presidents uh, yeah. Organization. Um, Chief is a, is a new one and on the scene, newish one on the scene for female executives. Um so there are all of these different organizations for people under the kind of core thesis of it's lonely at the top um, when you're an executive, especially female executives. And the reality is for independents. So think consultants, fractionals, advisors, really solo entrepreneurs. It's also lonely at the top for them. And the super challenging thing is, as I said, it's an entrepreneurial journey. You're a business owner. Um, but what's different is you're the CEO, CFO, CMO, COO, and you're doing it all by yourself. You don't have a team around you. Um, you left, you know, your team back at the the traditional nine to five. And when you do that, you miss out on a lot of the information, mentorship, momentum that comes from that. And so I actually think it's super, super critical for folks that are going independent or are already independent to over invest in their own professional networks and professional development, because that stuff will make it um, sustainable, more lucrative, more enjoyable. And you can guard against, you know, unforced errors from just not knowing how to do something. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I remember 
So my my consulting business was called Venture Archetypes. And mm -hmm. I remember we were trying to create like a cabal. Is that the right word? Of we were gonna get like a couple startup sure. attorneys, a, yeah, uh, a marketing, but we we're trying to create like a little that could trade startup deal flow and like go in and work almost as a, a virtual team. Sometimes it didn't really work because it was just too, we didn't have a good structure for that. So it sounds like that's a little bit about what you're doing. I guess, what is the killer, what, you know, the killer use case that you're seeing most people benefit from? Is it trading referrals or is it like trading advice or both? Probably both. Referrals definitely are something that come out of it. But what we know from working with so many of these folks is that the two most important areas for people to invest in is their own professional development. So learning all of those essential skills that you're going to use as a business owner, everything from pricing, marketing, positioning, design, all of that kind of stuff. And then the second thing is the communities and networks that they're a part of. So it's true for everyone, but especially for independents, your network is your net worth. And you really need to overinvest in that. The things that people come to us um, most often for are, one, they need guidance. Uh, two, they want to get validated in that they're making the right kind of decision in the right sort of way. And then three, they're ultimately looking for a transformation in their business. They're trying to reposition their business. They're trying to up-level their brand. They're trying to diversify their revenue streams. And so they join Pollen. It's this entrepreneurial ecosystem of the right information around them. So you can talk to people who have done that before. You can enroll in some programming that gives you the skills on how to do that. And ultimately, it's kind of like build your own major in a way. So you mm. go into this ecosystem, you get access to all of these things. And the reality is the problem with boot camps and super linear paths and these really long cohort programs is that they're missing the essential insight for these folks, which is the entrepreneurial journey is it's not linear. It's concurrent. You have mm -hmm. so many things happening at the same time. You have so many plates spinning that you have to keep spinning. And so to think that you can do step one, step two, step three, it's just not reflective of, of the reality. And so you, you join Pollen and you can really build and customize your own, ex your own experience. Yeah, I like that. The entrepreneurial journey is not linear, but concurrent. That's that's uh, yeah. interesting and very true. Is, <clears throat> how do I phrase this? You know, it seems like if I were a new consultant, just starting out, I would get the most from this network, but I would also have the least to kind of contribute. So is there sort of that, you know, issue of like, <laughs> Or, or, or I could ask this, <laughs> can anyone join? Like, can anyone join? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. It's actually one of the top complaints that we hear from other programs and communities that our members are a part of is they come to us and they go, yeah, I'm in this group, but I'm always answering other people's questions and I'm not getting anything back. And while I really like to help people, I'm really busy and yeah. I can't be doing that all day. And that, you know, emotional income is only so valuable. So I need a place where I can still get that because I enjoy helping people, but I can get access to other people who are a little bit ahead of me or maybe right alongside me. So completely hear you on that. Our solution to it is everybody has to apply to get in. So this is a, a vetted network. Reason being, we want to make sure that you fit our membership requirements, which are really simple. It's You've had a senior level position in your career before. Um, you're really good at what you do and you've gone independent. So if you have no clients, you've never tried this before, we're not going to be a good fit for you. We're really for people where their businesses are already humming. They're already on this path. Um, and then the other way that we make sure that people are you know, providing value and getting value, it goes back to that cross-sectional network that I talked about. So you have product folks, marketing folks, all of those other people, and they barter and exchange with each other so that you have complementary skill sets in here working together. And that stuff is so invaluable. Um, so we really design around that because nobody wants to be like so paying for a service and then painting the fence. Um, yeah. The other thing I would say too is... Is that a, is that a, Mark, the, is that a uh, Mark Twain, uh, Huck Finn reference, painting the fence? No, I think I... 
picked that up from uh, Kara Swisher, who maybe picked it up from Mark Twain. Um, I'm a big Pivot fan. So she said that one time about um, when Twitter was trying to charge her money. And she was like, I paint your friends. And I thought that was really clever. But um, the, the final thing I would say about this is that's one of the key reasons why we bring in those experts and residents. So these are folks who have been independent for a decade plus and are here purely to help you. So if you have a question, you can share that with them. They do office hours, programming, et cetera. And we have people across sales, pricing, scoping, legal, all of that stuff who are really there to send the ladder back down. Interesting. Is the bartering of services, like if I'm an attorney and I need some marketing collateral done for me and some marketing person needs some legal advice, is it is it like formalized? Like I put up an offer and other people, you know, is it is it kind of a marketplace yeah. or more informal? It's it's more informal. Mm -hmm. Um and the way that we have designed this community is around an ethos of being a collective. So when you help someone out, they're gonna help you out down the line. And so that's why it's about building real relationships. The moment that you start to add credits, tokens, money right. around it, it actually ruins all of that connective tissue within it. So you build real relationships, you build trust through true interactions, through all of the times that you meet people in the ecosystem, and then you start to help people. It's the same way that referrals come out too. So you asked about that earlier. There's yeah. other platforms that do like um, formalized referral programs. So you can kind of set up contracts and say, hey, if I refer you to someone, I'll get 10% 10, 10 of what that contract is worth. When you actually talk to people that use these platforms. That's not where their business comes from because that's it's not actually a motivator to refer people. And then you're actually competing on how much of my business can I give away mm. rather than who do I trust more? And who do I want to introduce my client to? Um, and who do I feel really confident is going to do a good job? And that only comes through building relationships outside of a sales environment, which is what Pollen provides. Mm. What was the, the genesis of this idea? Where did it come from? What were you doing? Yeah. So I, you know, I've been in this seat before. Uh, my background's in tech and startups. So I was living in San Francisco working at companies like Kiva. I was an early team member at Masterclass, um, at Bungalow, which is a co-living company, really solving loneliness and building community. And all of that was underpinned by a personal passion for economic mobility and the concept of how do you give people the keys to their own economic outcomes. It's what I studied, what I've been really passionate about since I was a kid. And um, through that work, I started SEO teams, growth teams, different product teams at these companies and started consulting. People were reaching out to me, asking me to do projects for them. And, and so I just started doing that and I was making good money. I really enjoyed the work. I really enjoyed calling the shots and working with different types of clients. And I, I you know, made that bet on myself, looked around and saw so many other people going independent and running into the same issues I did. How do I get started? How do I build a great business? Who else is doing this? Why are all the other you know, offerings out there super scammy and snake oily? Became super clear to me that, hey, this is the future of work. People want to work for themselves. People want to build a portfolio approach to their income where they have multiple income streams associated to their name that reflect their values and interests. But nobody is giving the guidance on how to do that. And nobody's going to go to business school to figure this out. So we need new infrastructure that helps people create that future of work that they want to create for themselves. And that's really the, the backdrop of pollen. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I, how, I'm i going to probably butcher it. I think I saw one <laughs> of those little cartoons in the wall street journal. It was like a consultant who was like, yeah, I, uh, I left left my nine to five and now I basically work twenty four seven or something. <laughs> you know, left, yes, left my nine yeah. to five to be a consultant, but it was kind of like grass is always greener kind of thing, you know, it's funny. Uh interesting stuff. Good stuff, good stuff. And do people stick around for a while? I mean, do people stay I, you guys have, haven't been around that long yourself, but like is this something that people come on and will stay on for life, or is it more of a, you know, as I'm getting my consulting going, I really need this? 
Um, both. So, mm -hmm. you know, as pe I often talk about um, these cycles of transformation that people go through. So the person that you saw in the cartoon is probably on the precipice of one where they're like, hey, I need to change this up. And it matches against a very normal cadence from the nine to five, which is getting a promotion and progressing in your career. So every like 18 to 36 months, someone like there's different phases. I'll back up a bit. There's a getting started phase where you're like, Hey, I got a client or two, but I really need to build the core business here. Yeah. So I got to figure out the legal stuff, the marketing stuff, the pricing stuff, my sales process. There's a lot to figure out. And so that's phase one. And once you have that humming, you have this creative energy that needs to be put somewhere. And so you're like, what's next for me? How do I want to scale this business? What do I want to do next? And that's the, your next cycle of reinvention. You want to give yourself a promotion. And people go all different paths. They start newsletters. They start communities. They start a podcast. Um, <laughs> they build some indie SaaS, something like that. You know, They do that. Another three years go by. And then they go, hey, I actually want to build an agency. So there's all of these cycles of reinvention that are inherent to the independent journey, just by nature of who these people are being so entrepreneurial. And so we support people through all of that stuff. We yeah. really build relationships with people for life and want to be there through their, through their whole career. Yeah. Interesting. Good. Um, what are uh, thoughts on, on future work? I mean, cause I think you're in a unique position where you're at, right? Like, uh, like where, what is the future of work? Here's an open-ended question. You can answer as anywhere you want. What's the future of work look like in five years or, you know, where are you guys seeing it go? Yeah. Um, I definitely think the future of work is independent. Mm -hmm. So this stuff was happening before COVID and COVID really accelerated it, which is people really value flexibility. They really put importance on doing work that matters to them personally um, and they want to make good money. And tons of people have recognized that the economic equation and the values-based equation for that becomes a lot more in the green once they've gone independent. And um, COVID just accelerated that. I think people reconsidered the way work fits into their life on a mass scale that we hadn't really seen at the same time like that. So in five years from now, what we're going to see are a lot more people um, going fractional, consulting, um, starting their own small businesses. And that it, that is the new goal for the most ambitious people. So they don't want to be in the rat race trying to all get the next like VP or C-suite level. They're going to say, hey, you know, I have people trying to hire me all the time. Why don't I work for all of them? And they might go into it temporarily thinking like it's between things, but then they really like it. And they won't settle for a job that doesn't match up for them perfectly. Um, the other thing I think too is, especially with the VC market, um, there has been this glorification of raising venture capital. And the reality is it's not the right thing to do for all of these businesses. And raising or starting a VC backed company is not a fun experience a lot of the time. And tons of people have an entrepreneurial energy they don't know where to put it. Previously, they thought it would go into VC. That market has become less attractive. And they're also seeing the downsides of that. And so they need to put it somewhere. So I think that there was an article in um, Every called The Rise of the Silicon Valley Small Business. I think that's going to be the new entrepreneurial goal is you start a business that is um, lucrative to you, enjoyable for you, and scales. And that's going to be really, really comfortable for people and, and the new goal. It's like a redefining lifestyle business. So it doesn't have a negative connotation anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. On the scaling part, do you guys, let me give you a long winded question. Do you guys have a, a way or, or stuff that helps people scale? Because I remember when I was a consultant, that was a hard part. We, we grew a little bit by hiring a few people. I think we got up to like four or five consultants. Mm -hmm. But that, the hard part was, of course, demand and supply, right? Keeping everyone busy, growing enough so there's enough demand to keep everyone busy. But like it was hard to scale as a consultant beyond a couple people. And you mentioned like the agent, you know, do I turn it into an agency? Like 
Do you have guidelines on on to help people scale up? Yeah, that's always one of the the biggest questions that we get from people. And I, I think it really depends on what phase you're in. So like the most kind of introductory phase is, hey, let's look at your billable hours and your non-billable hours. And let's let's match that against some benchmarks we have. And are you really being as efficient as you can? Um, what are your process look, processes look like? Can you use, you know, Airtable? Can you learn how to use Zapier? Can you start to save yourself an hour and a half every single day um, so that you're working less but making the same amount? So that's like phase one. Those are kind of straightforward things. As the business becomes, as the core business becomes more mature and hardened, then you start to think, how can I make money as I sleep? Mm-hmm. And how can I scale revenue faster than I scale my hours? So that's when we, you know, help people go, I don't know what I want to do, but here, I can take some programming on evaluating different business models and looking at, you know, a media type business versus a software type business versus an agency business and making the decision for myself, like which path do I want to travel more? And, you know, those have different um, outlier effects and not based on those. And so we give people really strong business fundamentals and principles that they can use to make decisions that are right for them. And then we also introduce them to all the tools under the sun that can help them do that. So we have workshops, we bring in external experts, they help you get set up with anything from QuickBooks to Substack to Hopscotch and and everything in between. So, um, you know, so much of the day to day is choosing the right tool and making the right decision that way. And so we make that a lot easier for folks. So they're not looking at a bunch of sponsored content when making those decisions. Yeah, that's cool. Let's talk about raising capital. How much have you guys raised? so far we've raised four million dollars um from a mix of institutional vcs and angels and we have we have a great group of investors and that was over two rounds so uh raised an initial pre-seed in april 2022 and then raised a seed in uh april 2023 got it and you worked at a venture fund before this so maybe share what it was like to Raise capital for a startup, having come from VC, were you able to take some Jedi lessons and <laughs> put, them to, put them to work? Yeah. I don't know how Jedi I am, but um, I had the pleasure of, of learning from some of the greats in VC. Um, yeah, so context there, worked in, in product at startups, was kind of involved in the fundraising process, but from a distance. So making sure we hit our goals, presenting to the board, uh, but it had always been really mysterious to me. How does that part work? Um, and so I sought to demystify that for myself. I actually went to business school and during that time worked at a seed stage fund called Founder Collective. Um, and they're incredible. So if anybody is thinking about what firm should I you know, get to know and, and respect, I, I couldn't suggest them and my other investors too. I, I'm very grateful for their relationships. So I worked for them for about a year and yes, you learn the machinations and the process of how to run a process and pitch deck formats and stuff like that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a boot camp in business design. You learn what right. business models are harder, what distribution strategies are better for a certain audience or not. You get to ask questions to entrepreneurs. You get to see how they're analyzed behind the scenes too. And um I would, I'm very grateful for the experience of working with the Founder Collective team because they're just like at a, a level of experience and thoughtfulness and realness that I uh, deeply value. And so I learned a ton from working with them. It was amazing. They, and yeah, I yeah. met some amazing founders along the way too. So I was able to build relationships with a bunch of different founders who I now am on the same side of the table as. And that's really fun as well. Are they a small, medium, or large fund? I've heard of them. I've never, I don't think I've ever pitched them or anything like that. What are they? Yeah, uh, they're a small fund, purposely small. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, don't, I might say the wrong exact number here, but it's around like a $90 million fund. They're their biggest LPs. 
and they purposely keep the fun small. They really only focus on the seed stage and um, they're not trying to be a huge multi-stage fund because it's um, tough to stay aligned with the founder if that's, if that's the business you're creating. So their entire ethos is, hey, we want to be the most aligned fund for founders at seed stage. We'll invest and then we'll dilute right alongside you. So we'll never lead the series A. There's no you know, negative signal risk. We'll work our tails off to get that round done for you. We've built all the relationships in the ecosystem to do that. Um, but we're really here to be honest with you and to work with you and to partner with you. And um, they've all been founders before. So it just drives a level of empathy that is very, very different than, than many other funds. So getting back to raising capital. Uh, for, yeah. Uh, do you go to them first? I believe, did they lead you around? I mean, was it uh, as straightforward as like, hey, I've got an idea. <laughs> you guys back me. <laughs> Probably not um, <laughs> no, definitely not that easy. Um, you know, sometimes it's like, you, if you know people so well, you have like so much information. Um, mm. And so they had known me for a year, worked with me for a year, and been a part of a lot of the earliest days of, of designing pollen and were so helpful to me in that, in those phases. And um, I still had to pitch them still had to get them to conviction. Like, you know, they don't just kind of break process for their favorites or whatever. Um, they really want to battle test every decision that they make. They take it super seriously. So I wanted to go to them first. I, I really enjoyed the relationships that I built with them and still have with them. Um, and so I went to them first and they helped me fill out the rest of the round too. Um, and then I went to Chauncey Hamilton at XYZ, who I knew from being in an organization called Dorm Room Fund, um, which I was in during business school and Chauncey used to work there. And Chauncey's a fantastic investor and, and human and a friend of mine now. And, um, they came in as kind of the, the second institutional for that round in the pre -seed. Yeah. It was just those two, or did you fill it out with some other? And then I filled the rest of that pre-seed out with angels. So handful of angels, um, Dan Summers, the first check into pollen and, uh, helped kick a lot of that stuff off. Um, and other angels, mostly founders and operators and, uh, you know, other tech folks and startup people no. were so helpful. So, so helpful. That's great. How did you, were these just people, you know, or how'd you recruit these folks into your round? Yeah, these are people that um, I met through working in startups, working yeah. in tech, and then also just being in the entrepreneurial ecosystem um, in New York and San Francisco. And so one of my like principles for fundraising is, hey, are these good people and are they going to treat me well? I really think capital is a commodity. And if I'm going to bring someone onto the cap table, I want to value their opinion and I want to build a great relationship with them. And so when I went out looking for, for angels, I, you know, reached out to the people I really admired. I asked other people who they admired and, and met people that way. So um, it's a mix of, of, of folks that I've met over my career. Yeah. 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 Good. Um, let's see. What have I not asked you? What, you know, any advice for founders, uh, raising in this market um other advice you kind of gleaned from your time at founder collective and now as a as a founder what else would you like to share yeah um i just to extend what i was already talking about on on the relationships like these these relationships are long and they're not always like roses and happiness like building a business is hard yeah. And you want people who don't shy away from the ugly parts. So I talked about Founder Collective and XYZ. My other institutionals are also Animo, who led the seed and then uh, Precursor. All of those investors have seen it before. They don't shy away from it. In fact, they look harder at the ugly parts and they don't judge you for it. So it would be so difficult to have tough conversations with these folks and, and for them to, you know, attack me personally, that never happens. Um, and I think that speaks to the level of their experience and their maturity. And 
their deep empathy for the founder experience. So I would like lead with that. And some other pieces of advice, like what used to be contrarian in this market, but is definitely now not is when you're raising, don't optimize for minimal dilution because it's going to make it harder to raise the next round. And if you can't pass those valuation metrics, you're going to raise a down round and that's going to dilute you more. So um, go with something that's healthy, that obviously doesn't dilute you to the point of you not having the economic incentives to build this business, but really focus on getting checks from folks that you can build good relationships with. And then other advice, get to know faster. You're going to get no's. What you don't want to do is waste your time. No is no is a good thing. No means, Hey, we made a decision. Now we can move on. And I can, I can really focus on the ones that are going to get to yes. Um, investors will take their time in this market. And so if they're not excited and banging on the table and, and getting back to you, um, that's okay. But focus on the ones that really are. This I like that advice. It's always tricky because when someone says no, the door shut for the most part. So I think founders yeah. don't want to push to get to that. No. So here's my question. Do you have any clever <laughs> verbiage or techniques to get that no without being super annoying and pushy? <laughs> yeah. This is like something I'm with you because you're like founders, we're all kind of like delusionally optimistic. Sure. Definitely. <laughs> and so e- even if even if it looks like the door is closing, we're like, but is it still an inch open? Um, so I, I completely get it. I think um, some vernacular, it's like if someone is kind of on the fence and you just want to get an answer from them, obviously you hope that it's yes, but if it's no, you can kind of say to them like, hey, it's okay. You don't want to do it. That's totally fine. Let's move on. And so it's not like you forcing a no, but it's, you know, reducing the friction or, or them feeling bad. And maybe sometimes they'll be like, but no, we do want to do it. So it can always like, uh, it makes them feel comfortable. Um in saying no or yes, yeah. so it could go either way. Yeah, I like that. That's good. I like that. Reducing the friction, just don't make it such a stigma to say no. Just if you're not into it, just a hundred percent. And a it. lot of the time, like this stuff is at the end of the day a numbers game. Um, it's obviously, hey, is your business right? Are you the right founder? How's the market for this? Is your pitch connecting? Are you talking to the right people? Um, and it's also a numbers game. Everybody's going to get no's. You're going to get more, way more no's than you are yeses. That's advice that people have heard a million times. And so just get to the no's faster. What I'm not saying is don't put effort in. I'm just saying, hey, like really focus on, on, on the things that are working and the people that are excited. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Excellent. All right. If people, especially consultants, want to learn more, it is um, run pollen. Let me make sure I have your runpollen.com, correct? Correct. You can find us at runpollen.com, R-U-N, pollen.com. And applications are open. Um, please apply. We have some really exciting upcoming programming and, and sprints, um, and we'd be excited to to meet you. Good. Are you guys thinking about the next round yet? Or actually a two-part question. Sure. Are you thinking about another round or would you even go out in this market? We're in Q4. It's kind of a tough market. Like, are you waiting for a better market? I don't know. Yeah. We are not uh, in fundraising mode right now. The way I usually approach it is like, it is a mode that you're in. I, I don't find a ton of value from taking investor conversations when I'm not ready to pitch. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like going into battle with no armor. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a, advice from one of my angel investors and, uh, and it's also a huge distraction. So right now we have, we have a ton of, of capital. Um, we also keep our burn rate very, very low. So that's, um, one of our core principles is capital efficiency. And, um, for this market, like right now it's late November. I think the timing would be tough to get something done before the end of the year, investors go on vacation to you know monte carlo and wherever they go and they have a great time um so you want to give yourself time i think it'd take longer than than two or three weeks in this market um 
I think January is a great time to reflect on the business, to work on the pitch deck. I think the fundraising process is so helpful in building a better business. So it's about reflection. It's about honing it in. It's about getting feedback. You create new strategies through that process. So I think it's a very creative process that has benefits that go beyond, you know, going out and acquiring capital. Um, and I think January is a great time to do that and kicking off in the spring. Uh, Cause then you don't run into the summertime and wintertime and holidays, vacation kind of minefield in the back half of the year. Yeah. Good. I, I like that also. Uh, Cause I tell people, even if you don't end up raising capital, you're getting feedback on your startup totally. idea and input from lots of smart people. Now, sometimes it's conflicting and makes your head spin around, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. free focus groups in some ways, right? Like, yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah, and being able to, uh, you just, you're going to get a ton of feedback and you have to hone in your filter for what's going to be helpful and what's not and whose feedback you're going to listen to more carefully than others. But it's all, it's all just information and just getting the information and doing with it what you want. But the information is, is helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Hillary, thank you. I'll let you go. Um, runpollen.com. Check it out. Especially if you're a consultant, go apply and uh, we'll catch you after your next round and see what's what's changed, what's new, all that good stuff. Thanks. All right. Cheers. Thanks for having Thanks. me.